to today's featured panel discussion, the battery materials supply crisis. Uh, unfortunately, due to some last minute technical difficulties, Chris Ecclestone is unfortunately unable to join us today as our session moderator. Um, I'll be taking that role, uh, but uh, really, I'm pleased to introduce our panelists, the stars of today's show. We have the CEO of Ceylon Graphite, Donald Baxter, President and CEO of EV Nickel, Sean Sampson, CEO of Power Nickel, Terry Lynch, and CEO and Chairman of Giga Metals, Mark Jarvis. So before we begin in earnest, I'd like to invite our audience to participate by posing questions to our panel through the use of the Q&A panel found on the right-hand side of your screen beside the public chat. As always, today's event is being recorded and is going to be available online in the coming days on 6.com for some on-demand viewing. But to get us started, uh, in no particular order, I'd like to go around the room, um, offer you gentlemen the opportunity to introduce yourselves, quickly introduce your company, uh, and in a handful of minutes, we can uh, get started with some questions about uh, the topic of the day. Uh, Don, I'd like to maybe uh, get us started with you. Sure, great. Thanks, Cameron. Uh, yeah, so yeah, Don Baxter, I'm the CEO of Salon Graphite. Uh, actually, I'm presently in Colombo, the capital of, of Sri Lanka, uh, where our projects are. Um, there was actually a pretty cool tower lit up behind me before we started this, and it just, the light just went out. So, um, figures. Um, but uh, so anyway, so Salon Graphite is in the mining, uh, sort of mine to battery business, as it were. Um, there's two natural forms of graphite um, that are used in batteries, flake and, and vein. So we're, we are unique where the only true vein graphite in the world is located in Sri Lanka. Uh, at one point, there were 3,000 mines here uh, up until the Second World War. We have two right now. Uh, and we're looking to you know, revive an industry here. Um, with the demand coming uh, for lithium ion batteries, uh, it makes it a perfect opportunity to um, build um, many mines to increase um, uh, our potential to have, you know, 50, 100,000 tons or more, um, which the market will need. Uh, and we're also the first to make a lithium ion battery with Sri Lankan vein graphite. And it, it, it shows that it, it works extremely well. Uh, the graphite here in the ground is 95 carbon, and uh, so that eliminates our need for any kind of primary processing. Uh, I've been in this space for, for quite some time, and uh, so we have a certain expertise in, in, in taking the graphite and making it into an anode for a lithium-ion battery. Um, so we're doing that uh, in the UK, but our main source of material um, is here in Sri Lanka. So we are building, you know, we have two mines, near-term production, uh, and we'll just keep adding to our portfolio uh, from our massive grid system here. Um, and we'll just look forward to feeding into this system or into this uh, upcoming um, huge demand for electric vehicles uh, for, for batteries. So um, I'll pass it over now to the next uh, next guy here, Cam. Yeah, absolutely. And how about uh, we go over to you, Mark? Okay, I'm uh, Mark Jarvis. I'm CEO of uh, Giga Metals. Uh, we've got a, a, a giant deposit of sulfide, nickel, and cobalt in north central British Columbia. Um, we recently came out with a new resource estimate. We've got about 1.5 billion tons of, uh, of deposit in the measured plus indicated category, a uh, total of 7 billion pounds of contained nickel. Um, we make a very nice 18% uh, nickel, 1% cobalt concentrate. Um, and we've recently concluded a joint venture with the Mitsubishi Corp. Um, they now have 15% uh, interest in our joint venture company and they're funding uh, the pre-feasibility uh, study, which we're currently at work on. Um, so we're just advancing this, this uh, giant project and, uh, you know, uh, basically in this, uh, in this space, uh, we think at some point all hell is going to break loose and we're just trying to get this thing as advanced as we can before that happens. Fair enough. All right. And uh, Sean, I'd like to pass things over to you. Yeah. Uh, Sean Sampson, EV Nickel. Um, we have project in Northern Ontario, just below Timmins. So we're just outside of the mining town of Timmins. We have a very large land package, 30,000 hectares with uh, over hundred kilometers of strike on our property that we're exploring. We have a two track strategy. We have a, a high grade business where we have an historic resource in the ground of a little under 700,000 tons at 1%. 
That's all within 200 meters of surface. We've drilled beneath that. We think we're going to double that with a resource that we'll come out with next year. Um, that, in combination with other high-grade mineralization nearby, we think we can package it into a high-grade business. And we're permitting now on our high-grade deposit, where we think we'll have um, that into production in three to four years. We have a nearby plant that's permitted. It's owned by one of our investors, uh, permitted and operates now. So that high-grade business has one track. Our other track is we have an enormous low grade trend. We've got a 10 kilometer long stretch that looks a lot like some other low grade deposits that are in the Timmins area. We've drilled off a kilometer and a half of it, so 15%. Uh, we're coming out with those assays over the next few months. So we'll put out a resource at the beginning of next year, which will be a big number for one of those low grade, we call it large scale deposits. So we're nickel in Ontario. We have the two tracks. One is something it should be producing in three to four years with a nearby concentrator. And the other is likely to be something huge um, that if it comes into the money and the nickel price and the world of nickel continues to narrow and that's economic, then we'd likely partner with somebody on that. But we push those two tracks and I'm actually in Germany this week. Uh, I've had meetings with the car companies, sort of the third meeting in a few months. Um, and we are pushing forward on that high grade business. And those are conversations we're having about that. All right. And last but not least, uh, Terry, over to you. Yeah, thanks, Tim. And uh, good to be here with everyone. So Power Nickel is developing or, or uh, exploring at the NISC project. And it's uh, located just south of James Bay in Quebec. It's uh, probably one of the easiest uh, mining uh uh, opportunities I've seen. It's you drive off the road and there it is and cross on the other side of the road is a major Hydro-Quebec substation. So it's a, it's near civilization, which is really awfully convenient. Uh, we're having some great uh, drilling results. We're drilling right now. We had a drill program last year that was very successful. We had a historic resource of about 3.1 million tons of about, I don't know, 1.5 to 1.6 percent nickel EQ, about 1 percent nickel, uh, depending on what price you use for nickel. Uh, and we'll have a uh, uh, we'll finish about 7,000 meters by mid-December this year, and uh, look to have a updated resource out uh, late Q1, early Q2, and uh, we'll probably you know I don't know we'll, we'll certainly look to be doubling our historic resource and then some. So uh, I think we're on track to become uh, you know uh, to prove that it's a, a commercial deposit and. Uh, the neat thing about nickel sulfate discoveries of this nature is that uh, it's we're, we're currently working on what we call one pod, and it's a uh, typically these types of things are a string of pearls, and there's usually more than one pearl. There's usually you know in these uh, nickel sulfate deposits the world over, there are always three or four pods. So uh, we think we can get to eight to ten million tons on this one pod, and then we hope to find some other pods. It's an ultramafic deposit, so you know other uh, examples of that in Canada uh, were. Lynn Lake and Flin Flon for uh, about 22 million tons and obviously Voices Bay with this uh, plus 50. So we're hoping we can ultimately get in between there and that would make it uh, a very exciting time for uh, for Power Nickel shareholders. So that's the Power Nickel story. No, oh, fair enough. All right. Well, gentlemen, thank you. Now that we've uh, moved through the introductions, we can get started in earnest with today's conversation about battery materials supply crisis. To start, you know, so last year the federal government announced all new cars and light duty trucks sold in Canada would be zero emission vehicles by 2035. However, with the expected shortage of EV batteries by 2024, 2025, what do you think is the single most important factor that the Canadian government should consider in order to meet the supply demands of this shift towards electrification? Um, I'd like to pose that question to anyone in the group that wants to take it. I'll start. Probably, probably, it, it's probably uh, any government you can ask, you can ask that question about Canada, United States, uh, and and what I'm seeing is that um, there's been all sorts of talk about, you know, Tesla and electric vehicles, and, and everybody's jumping on the bandwagon, and and uh, you know, Super Bowl commercials about electric vehicles, but um, and announcements about building factories, but no one's really thinking about the supply chain that's going to feed those factories, and I think. We're all in the same boat where we're seeing that uh, the OEMs are now just starting to realize that 
we need to sort of step up now our game a lot faster and you know the demand in, in my space graphite you know the probably the current consumption in batteries is between probably 500 thousand tons uh to maybe eight hundred thousand but by 2030 that's gonna be two point or say a little over four million tons of, of processed graphite for batteries so right now you know 100 percent of that natural graphite comes from china and 65 percent of the synthetic graphite comes from from china as well so i think in all our cases china is the elephant in the room and they're building factories at a faster rate than anybody else is um, and you know, I've been chirping the uh, the graphite story for for too long. Uh, finally, uh, it's starting to resonate, and um, uh, we're getting that. Um, you know, it's been lithium and cobalt and nickel, and graphite is the anode. Uh, so you can't make a battery without graphite. So I think we're finally seeing it starting to be recognized. But governments now are finally stepping up, but they also have to open up the purse strings uh, to start developing and, and also helping on the permitting side of things. Yeah, I would uh, pick up on that. I mean, uh, you know, it's 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 one thing to talk about supply chains and needing strategic materials and so forth, but I think particularly in Canada, uh, the government does need to pay more attention to permitting. Um, it's you know the process is a bit slow here, I would say, um, and it's it's fine. It's very thorough. You know, you should have thorough environmental reviews, particularly of large mining projects. But, you know, why can't we be quicker like Australia is? Um, you know, they do a good thorough job, but they don't take as long as we take in Canada to do it. So I would suggest that, you know, that's an important thing to, to, to pay attention to. And in terms of purse strings, I think the governments are starting to create, you know, like things like the billion dollar infrastructure fund to support, uh, you know, critical materials in Canada. That's helpful. Um, but I, you know, I think where we are right now is the large mining companies are still very tentative about taking on new projects. There, you know, it's still a hangover from sort of 2008 when everybody was buying everything and they were paying too much and then all the CEOs got fired. So, so, so far they've been very tentative. And then the car companies and battery companies are realizing that to compete with China, they need to invest upstream in critical materials. That's as far as their thinking has gotten. Uh, you know, they're just starting to think, well, maybe we should hire some mining engineers. Um, and they haven't really opened their purse strings yet. And my prediction is that it'll be nibble, nibble, nibble. And then I really think there's going to be, uh, you know, everything's going to go crazy. There'll be a panic buying of projects at some point here. And I'm really looking forward to that. <laughs> well, I can echo that, Mark. I, it was interesting to see, um, you know, what's happening with Talon Metals, which is in the nickel space. And we've got three of the guys here in nickels. And, um, yeah. you know, where they got that grant from the um, U.S., uh, you know, Critical Minerals Department mm -hmm. or whatever they're, or whatever they're calling it. DOD, but, Department and, of Defense. Yeah, they're, they're interesting to see how it's sort of it's being applied. They, they actually seem to be breaking up like they're obviously still have, the mine is in Minnesota, but the processing is going to be in, I think, Wyoming or North Dakota. No, I just North, forget. North, North Dakota. Dakota. South Dakota. OK, so so it's 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 interesting that that they're doing that in, in an attempt to get to market by, I think, 2017 is the goal, which is like, as you guys know, that's like that'd be a miracle <laughs> if, if it's not in the ground right now. But. I mean, that just goes to show you how um, how fast we would have to move in this country to hit the targets that the government has set. So, as Mark said, you know, the environmental process is, you know, nobody's saying let's skip elements that are, need to be considered, but it has to be done a lot quicker, and there has to be a, you know, more. Uh, and it's it's really the staff that they need on the government side of things has to be increased. They need to, they need guys that can actually do the reviews quicker. They're just not out there. I don't know what the solution is, but that's going to be one. If they want to help, that's where they got to They got to get more more staff to do the due diligence that they need to get done in order to be ensure that there's no nasties being done uh, on the mining side. Because we're certainly not wanting to do that as miners, but there's a process, but it has to be expedited. Otherwise, we'll never hit those targets. Absolutely. Uh, Sean. Yeah, I think we're, I, I personally am seeing it with my project in Ontario, the alignment, even though uh, 
politically, you think that the uh, leadership in my province versus the federal government should not be aligned. They are completely aligned uh, on critical metals. So I, I see good things, supportive things, and a quick, straightforward path to permitting uh, a new mine. But there is time involved in it, obviously. And what I'm trying to do first is, is relatively small. Uh, but I think there are some positive signs, at least from the political end. Uh, Terry, that's an interesting point about you know hiring up staff. Um, I think oftentimes uh, when we're in the weeds on permitting, as miners, we're dealing with the bureaucracies. And oftentimes I feel the bureaucracies are genuinely understaffed. Yeah. So perhaps it's a, you know, there are big numbers being talked about, um, whether it's the infrastructure bank or other big numbers that are announced around this critical metals thing. Uh, but perhaps some of that dough should be put into the ministries to speed the process along. Mark, it'd be very interesting to know if there's more um, sort of staff reviewing projects in Australia, making that part of the reason it, it is perceived as going a little little easier. But, but Cam, to answer your question, you know, what can the federal government do? I, I'm not so much a fan um, policy-wise of um, money sloshing into our industry. Like I feel as though if we have clear guardrails, we can run ourselves between the guardrails. Uh, it's just making our permitting more efficient and ensuring that when they back up what they're saying when they're pro-critical minerals, uh, ensure that the processes are in place to allow us to get forward with what we want to do. Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, I, I, I just want to say I tend to agree with Sean is that, you know, governments, you know, it's always a little scary when governments start picking winners and losers because they historically aren't very good at it. Uh, but the one exception I would make is uh, towards infrastructure funding. I mean, mm -hmm. I think that that, uh, that there is a role for government in infrastructure funding, power lines, highways, you know, uh, that sort of thing. Um, but anyways, yeah, <laughs> yeah, governments make me nervous when they're, <laughs> you know, trying to help. Fair enough. Oh, well, we got some uh, some great directions from you guys, uh, and obviously we're listening to you know the perspectives from graphite and nickel. But uh, mm -hmm. you know, when investors think about battery metals required to fuel the electrification of the world, they often think of lithium. So, what should yeah. investors and the people in the room right now, you know, uh, know about the role that other battery metals play in the upcoming battery materials demand? I'd say, I, first of all, graphite's not a metal. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a metallic, uh, non-metallic mineral. But um, that's the one thing we get looped in with the battery metals. I usually say battery materials. But, you know, it, it, what I see it as, it, you know, it's it's been all about lithium. Um, and that's sort of been more the junior mining space. And, and uh, um, it's a lithium-ion battery. So that's what everybody looks looks after. But it's it's they're all engineered materials that go into these batteries. So it's a matter of, of not just having a deposit, it's also that ability to process to take it right to the end, which which we're doing uh, to take it right from, like I, I've always said, the world doesn't need more graphite, it needs more processed graphite for batteries. So, um, but it's, I think it's just, it's just we take, some things we take for granted and, we don't realize that you know we want to we want to decarbonize the the planet and 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 whatnot and we want to build all these electric vehicles but we still have to mine the materials in order to make all these and in the case of graphite um majority uh, majority of the material used uh, in the anode is graphite but it's it's synthetic graphite and synthetic graphite is is basically petroleum coke that's graphitized. So it's a byproduct from refining oil. So it's kind of counterintuitive. We're trying to get off fossil fuels and they're using a fossil fuel to make, you know, an anode, a graphite, an artificial graphite, um, where natural graphite can be very, um, uh, very, um, you know, much better performance and, and better capacity. Um, and also it's, it's, it's actually cheaper to, and probably to develop a mine than it is to to build furnaces to 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 graphitize the petroleum coke but um all the materials we, we need them all um and it's a question of people realizing that they can't even even their iphones and and everything we're you know we're, we're all using right now all, all require batteries walk around electronics um and it's it's coming faster than most people think uh but it, the, the the supply of this material has been neglected on all fronts mm -hmm. Fair we enough. required our deposit from uh, critical uh, elements, which is a lithium 
Uh, they just got their permit yesterday, finally from Quebec. They had their federal permit. Now they got the provincial permit. So their final fees availability fully permitted. So I, I expect great things from that uh, company. I'm, a, uh, you know, just go. I'm an investor there. But, but uh, you know, lithium. There's hard rock and there's and there's um, the uh, uh, the solvent side. And and I think you know there's going to be a lot of interesting lithium plays in Canada from what I'm seeing. And uh, yeah, I think there's going to be good growth in that sector. And and as uh, Donald said, that's been one of the sectors that's gotten a bit more attention in the market. That's probably been one of the more you know healthier you know sectors of the mining market. Is lithium is still you know still sort of perceived as uh, you know hotter for some reason, and it's done well. But uh, you know I, I think that's uh, that's encouraging to see that these permits finally coming through, and I think you'll start to see you know partnerships with auto automakers and i think these things already start to as that starts to happen it's like you know uh, the one thing i say to people about north american nickel and i think that's such an important point to make is that if you want to get these full uh tax deductions or or incentives that are being provided by the u.s government and probably by the canadian government at some point uh, for your electric vehicle you got to have north american nickel and they just don't have enough of it right now you know so it's just just not possible yeah, I can actually hang some numbers on that. I've, you know, we've looked at um, uh, the gigafactories in North America that have already been announced, and you know, it depends what percentage will be uh, LFP batteries which don't have nickel, and which percentage will be you know higher nickel chemistry batteries. Uh, but it's going to be somewhere between two hundred and fifty and four hundred fifty thousand tons per year of you know incremental nickel supply just for that and and i think it's going to be closer to the 450 because in north america we like range and that's what nickel does nickel is mm -hmm. uh, very good at yeah. electrons and uh you know you need more nickel in the battery chemistry and the cathode chemistry if you want more range it's just that simple um so at, it, and it's not trivial it's not just the mines it's the processing i think you know i think don with uh, you know graphite you've got a simpler route to the anode mm -hmm. that we've got with the cathode because you know we can make a concentrate that's step one now what i mean you can send you can sell it to a smelter and that's what we're modeling um you know and then from a smelter you know they can make just about anything uh in their refineries at the back end of the smelter but um ultimately the battery makers want sulfate at least right now that 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 mm -hmm. that processing route may change and I know of all sorts of interesting technologies being worked on but just the amount of processing to take it to the cathode and the amount of purification is something that I don't think that the politicians are really considering enough um, so you're you're gonna need all these mines I think you know all of these nickel deposits you know in this room right now are gonna have to be developed and then some and, and people that aren't in this room their deposits are going to have to be developed, and it still won't be enough. Um, so, you know, it's interesting. We've got three nickel companies here. I don't regard anybody as really competition. It's just we're all going to need to be developed at some point. Yeah. Um, but also, the downstream refining to actually take this material to the cathode is a non-trivial problem that I don't think is getting enough uh, attention. Absolutely. Uh, and Sean, do you have any thoughts? Yeah, we're, we're doing some interesting stuff with our project where we're trying to figure out um, what we can add to the existing local concentrator to potentially jump the step and not require the smelter. So we're, we're doing some work on bio leaching and taking, uh, now we're in the lab analyzing, taking a high grade concentrate out of the existing plant and with uh, bio leaching into vats, being able to produce nickel sulfate or precipitate out a different product that the end users could use. Um, so that's still just lab work, but I echo Mark, if uh, we can't sort something out or we can't be more creative uh, on, on having that step, we're then still beholden to the existing smelters. And, um, you know, back to the point about supportive governments and willingness to permit, you know, it's one deal if you're talking about uh, permitting mines, uh, and then pump permitting sort of the concentrator step, but smelting, you know, the, those there's a reason why they're very rare and material goes around the world to reach them. Uh, I'm not sure if we're necessarily ready to be permitting 
um, base metal smelters up and down the country to um, to to reach the critical metal demand or critical material or critical metal demand. So it gets complicated. It's it's interesting. You know, we, we have uh, you know a lot of assets in Chile, and it, Chile has a unique uh, structure in mining. They have um, Anami, which is is sort of yeah. a, a, a a public smelter, if you would, and and smelter for the local, people. Local local miners and small mining companies can mine ore and bring it to Anami, and uh, they smelt it, you know, and make copper. And uh, I always thought that was a great idea. You know, I thought that was a way to put uh, a lot more small mines to work. You know, and uh, you know, I, I wonder now in, in this in this sector, nobody's ever been talking about it, but wouldn't it be wouldn't it be great if there was some more nickel smelting capacity in the Ontario Quebec uh, region that we could uh, we could access? Uh, you know, for uh, for the battery metal sector. You know, and and. Uh, you know, that might be, you know, something that the government could do that could, you know, de-risk a lot of projects and move things along, but, you know, in a productive way, but thinking outside the box. Yeah, I think and then we could start, we could start uh, picking yarrow mining around the fence outside of the valet and the Glencore assets. <laughs> <laughs> and, and bring it to look, an look, those guys process. those guys have led to a lot of mine discovery don't be uh, uh <laughs> yes. got a lot of good i've had a i've had a lot of good surveys with my friends in the the pick and arrows they're, <laughs> they're they're interesting cats you know i think myself the more likely route is going to be a pressure oxidation uh to um deal with concentrates and that's already done i mean it's already done uh in Alberta, uh, you know, for Saskatchewan, uh, you know, Sheriff's Refinery, you know, started off as a as a concentrate refinery. Um, it's also done at Long Harbor, you know, by Valle. Um, and and you know, the thing about pressure oxidation is is very flexible. Um, you can create almost any product you want. You can create MHP. You can create sulfate. Depends what you put on the back end. You could also create nickel briquettes. Um, all of which are forms of nickel that um, battery makers want. So I just think, you know, it's uh, pressure oxidation is probably less environmentally uh, objectionable than smelters, but it's also, I think, more flexible uh, because nickel is about, I mean, nickel is not just a simple metal yeah. market. It's got many, many different forms. And, uh, you know, mostly what the battery makers want is various chemical forms of nickel that they can then process to count those materials. Definitely a lot of things to consider and a lot of uh, potential paths forward. But uh, you know, this year, automakers plan to build 7.7 .7 million electric vehicles and are only going to have access to enough nickel to build around 3.6 million that can travel 400 kilometers or more on a single charge. Terry, this question is for you. You know, what can you tell investors about the role that nickel plays in increasing the energy density of NMC batteries? Well, I mean, I mean, just the, the technology is such that the reason why they're putting more nickel in the batteries is, is that they're getting better energy, energy density, uh, greater power, um, longer life, you know, less corrosion. So all those things are, are especially as Mark said, in North America, uh you know are, are needed because cars do travel a long ways here and and uh so um you know i think that that's why nickel is as mark pointed out is going to go up in in percentage use in the batteries and and uh and the weight of it in the batteries because it's just it's it, it ultimately leads to a overall more efficient battery and a and a less weight battery and, and uh, longer distance better range better cycles so you know all those things are are a plus it's interesting and in i think you know the reality of of uh, you know it's like when nickel went crazy there and went to i don't know whatever i don't know what the, the bottom the top price was on that short squeeze but it was obviously you know a 30 dollars nickel isn't going to work you know, okay <laughs> just just like uh, you know, I, I, I'm not familiar with the graphite prices, but if you put ten times it, it probably wouldn't work for graphite either. There's su everything is substitutable, you know, and so nickel is substitutable too. But I mean, in terms of the, uh, you know, eleven, twelve, fifteen dollars, I think that that's the sweet spot, you know, for nickel, and everyone in this room can make a lot of money at those price points. And we could uh, justify a lot of investment in nickel in, in, in those in those uh, areas. And I think the price curve for nickel looks very favorable as a result of, 
you know, its inherent capabilities. And you got, I mean, two things drive the nickel market, urbanization, which is basically as people are moving from agrarian economies to cities and, and villages, they're buying more fridges and stoves, pots and pans, and that's stainless steel. And then the second big driver is electrification, you know, so as, as we, you know, as the percentage of EVs goes up in the world, you're, you're getting to these crazy numbers where, you know, you're just going to have to have, you know, so many new nickel mines come into being and, 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 and so much investment going to nickel. But, and as, as Mark said, I don't know when this is going to, when these guys are going to wake up, <laughs> but it's gotta be soon because if they want to get this, uh, you know, hit their targets, uh, the uh, markets need to wake up soon so that we can get financed and get after our game. Absolutely. Oh. Yeah. Oh, can I just add one thing? I'm, I'm, first of all, Paul, I'm, I'm having trouble hearing everybody, I guess, from where I, my internet service isn't the best here, but hopefully you're hearing me. So I'm getting bits and pieces of what you guys are saying. But um, one thing I look at as far as, you know, be it nickel, lithium, graphite, uh, we need to build a whole lot more mines. Um, so it's not a question, you know, we're all in, you know, competition for, for investors and whatnot. But I think the investors know, for example, I think uh, Benchmark came out with a number of, of, you know, we need at least 79, you know, new graphite mines producing um, in, in the very near term at, you know, 50 to 100,000 tons per annum. I'm sure there's a similar number for nickel. Um, usually they're much larger deposits. Um, but um, overall, I think, and I also heard a bit about e ESG perspective and, and processing. Um, the beauty about um, graphite is that, uh, and especially vein graphite here in Sri Lanka, is that from an ESG perspective, we don't have the primary processing. So therefore, we don't have tailings, we don't have the waste rock dumps, and we don't have any kind of reagents or effluents from a tailings pond. Um, not that I haven't done that before in other, other minerals, but I'm just saying for this particular case, uh, when you're making the case and we're looking to replace an actual, um, an art, uh, a synthetic material with a natural material, which it usually is the other, other way around, but you know, we can make the, the, the graphite here um, work very well in a battery. It actually works better than, than flake. Um, and we can also do things to enhance that performance. I heard, I think Mark said something I heard about enhancing some of those capacities. Uh, we actually add in, like, we can add in a little bit of silicon. We take a, um, a, a, a nano silicon that we, 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 mix in with our, our spherinizing process um, and we can actually take the you know well beyond the theoretical limits of, of, of the current anodes so um, uh, that may be a bit out of context what I just said but again I'm trying to piece together what you guys are saying uh, overall but uh, I'll, hopefully you're hearing me okay. We are Don thanks yeah. and uh, it's great context absolutely um, you know going back to uh, sort of the conversation about EV specifically you know, of course I have to bring it up, but uh, Elon Musk, you know, said in July 2020 conference call that, uh, quote, Tesla will give you a giant contract for a long period of time if you mine nickel efficiently and in an environmentally sensitive way, end quote. And I mean, in this room, we've also seen a JV between Giga Metals and Mitsubishi. So question to the group, um, but I'm going to go to Mark first. But do you anticipate more auto manufacturers to follow suit? And, and Mark, for those who are unfamiliar with the JV, you know, what should investors know about the partnership? Oh, well, it's uh, the partnership is very simple. Um, uh, we sold Mitsubishi uh, a 15% interest in our project by forming a joint venture company. So we formed a 100% owned subsidiary with all of the Turnigan assets in it and then sold Mitsubishi 15% of that for $8 million. So pretty simple transaction. Uh, Mitsubishi... Uh, <laughs> It's a giant company. I mean, it's the largest trading company, uh, commodities trading company in Japan. Um, and that is a tiny part of Mitsubishi's overall business. They've got a couple of banks, they make cars. I mean, it's just a huge uh, conglomerate, um, but they're focused on battery metals right now. They're primarily focused on uh, nickel and lithium. Um, and they looked at, they told me they looked at 26 different projects around the world. And then, then, and then settled on us. A Tesla, you know, Elon Musk says all sorts of things, but I haven't seen them write a check yet. They like to sort of wave their magic wand around and spread some fairy dust around, which then helps, you know, the companies uh, to raise money. But I have yet to see them write a check. And, you know, it actually takes money to build mines. So, you know, so far, you know, maybe they'll get there. Uh, 
the other thing is about the car and battery companies, but I'm particularly talking about the car companies right now. A year ago, the thought of them investing upstream in a mining project was absurd. But that's not the case anymore. They are realizing that they're in trouble. If they want to be in the EV business and competing with China, they're going to have to own uh, critical, you know, critical mineral supplies. Um, and, and, you know, and if they don't, they're not going to be in the EV business. And if they're not in the EV business, they're not going to be in the car business. Yeah, you know, except maybe in a little specialty sense in, uh, you know, some kind of gas powered vehicles. So, you know, they've reached that stage of the thinking where they know they need to invest upstream. I'm just starting for the first time to see mining engineers when I'm talking to car companies. I just saw my, or I just talked to my first mining engineer at a car company, and he had been there when I talked to him for five days. So, you know, I mean, the thinking is progressing. It's bit by bit. It's incremental. But, but I'll say it again: it's 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 going to be one transaction. There'll be another transaction. And suddenly all hell is going to break loose and everybody's going to be buying everything as fast as they can. And uh, I, 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 you can see it coming. No, absolutely. Um, and I mean, it's uh, it'll be interesting to see where things go. Um, you know, Don, going over. Can I just add to that briefly, Cameron? I just want to say, too, I, we're, we're having conversations with OEMs that you know a year ago we wouldn't have had. And just to echo what Mark said, I think the OEMs are, are real, either, either full, you know, battery manufacturers or, or even the car companies, you know, the GMs, the Fords, the um, uh, Volkswagens, they're all coming up or coming down, I guess, up the supply chain, I guess, and, and realizing that they need to get out there. And as Mark said, they need to have their own people who can actually, you know, understand geology and mining and, and whatnot. But a few of them are still pretty slow to come out of their old ways and, and, uh, but I think we're seeing that the OEMs are really starting to, re and even, for example, uh, you know, a GM that doesn't necessarily want to rely on LG to be able to sort all the materials for them, they're actually doing it in parallel with, uh, uh, you know, with um, the feed their factories and not relying on on them to just give them a sell, uh, and 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 not have to and not have any control over their raw materials. So I think you're seeing that, or the input materials. I think you're seeing we're seeing that change, and again, it, it applies across the board for all these uh, every every battery material. No, fair enough, Don. Um, and you know, looking at China, who produced 79 percent of the world's graphite supply last year, uh, according to the USGS, at least. Um, you know, however, Sri Lanka has historically been the largest producer of graphite. You know, and so Don, this question is really for you. But what role do you think, as a jurisdiction like Sri Lanka? You know, plays in the long-term global demand for graphite. Well, uh, thanks. Uh, I, th I think I got most of the, most of your uh, question there. Um, so yeah, so right now, I mean, China is the elephant in the room. China produces, I think, it's over sixty-five or seventy-five percent of the of the world's flake graphite. But the main thing is for for battery material, spherical graphite, they produce a hundred percent of it. Um, so that's the big thing uh, with that regard in the world. You know, we're, we're finding that the OEMs, if they want to put something up in North America, they want non-Chinese graphite. They want non-Chinese processing methods. Uh, they're not exactly palatable to, to ESG perspectives uh, using hydrofluoric <laughs> acid, for example. So being in Sri Lanka, where we are, um, we're looking to revive an industry. So again, we have two mines permitted. Um, we're, we're just going to continue on permitting mines. Uh, at one point, uh, prior to the Second World War, there were 3,000 graphite mines in Sri Lanka. Uh, there's only three others right now, you know, barely operating. So the total output of graphite out of Sri Lanka has been pretty, pretty minimal. And, 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 and I say more for certain in industrial higher end. Uh, it has a higher value than, than flake. Uh, but um, we're looking to just continue to rapidly advance and build as many mines as we can. Um, and the fact that Sri Lanka right now has had some, some, you know, they basically the country went bankrupt. So they're looking to attract foreign investment and encourage investment. So we're doing what we can to try to hopefully streamline, help streamline permitting processes. And I mean, our capital cost for, for building one mine is about 2 million because we don't have the primary processing. Um, so I think Sri Lanka can be a significant player here. Um, it's a little bit difficult you know, coming kicking and screaming let's say they don't really understand yet what what we can do here so i think we're we're showing that we're here uh we've got two operations right now we 
employ 50 people, we can probably employ 500 or 5,000. So that's sort of where I think we can go with, with this. And um, the way the market's going, it needs as much graphite as it possibly can get. And the Sri Lankan vein graphite just happens to be very good in a, in a battery. So the theoretical limit uh, capacity is higher than flake. Um, so we'll, we probably will be able to sell and move everything we can produce. So it's a matter of producing as much as possible. Absolutely. Um, over to he, going over to you now, Sean. You know, EV Nickel plans to develop a zero carbon production of nickel and is applied even for the trademark clean nickel across several jurisdictions. Um, you know, can you tell us more about what clean nickel means, especially relative to your project at Shaw Dome? Yeah, so clean nickel is a term we've trademarked. It's uh, very clearly some genius marketing. But, uh, but beyond that, it's, it's in the DNA of the company. So we are rethinking every step of what we're doing, which you can do when you have a greenfield mine, uh, or I should say a, brown, a brownfield mine. It's nearby old mines, but uh, <clears throat> it's something we're building anew. So we're looking at electrifying everything we're doing with our underground operations. Um, you know, with the mall, for example, all the electricity that we draw where we are in Northern Ontario is hydro. So very low carbon cost attached to it. Uh, then we're also looking at ore sortation, our head grade that will go to the mill um, as best we can. The mill, if we use the one nearby that's been constructed, it sort of has its own carbon cost. But then I mentioned the bio leaching before, if we can add that on, that is also, it's exothermic. So it'll have a negative carbon cost because we should be able to generate electricity from it. And then in our tails, we're looking at the carbon capture potential, so the sequestration. That's definitely a thing for our Dunites, the low-grade business, um, our, our large-scale deposit. But each of those things, they fall in under the umbrella of clean nickel. And it also speaks to the ESG perspective that we have. So when I'm here in Germany having meetings with the car companies, they have some very early gating questions around ESG, around carbon cost. And frankly, the way I see the nickel price going is in the near future, we're going to start seeing price differentiation based on the carbon cost attached to the nickel units. So it's happening in other commodities that the buyers who have this front and center, and frankly, the buyers in our business, especially the new o the OEMs with this new demand from the EVs, the demand is ahead of supply on this area. So the demands that they're making with all this new demand that's coming into the nickel business is very different than all the stainless steel buyers, you know, up till today. So I see a change going forward in the nickel business. We've already sort of done it uh, with class one and other with the nickel world, but within class one, the nickel sulfides, based on what carbon cost is going to be attached to the nickel units, I see a split coming uh, with premiums and discounts based on what the carbon price is. So for us, clean nickel is a part of everything we do. Um, and it's a trademark term towards us trying to have as low possible carbon costs attached to our nickel production as we can. That's really, really interesting. Um, and you know, I think it's time to you know, go to, as, it, as it's been called, the elephant in the room. But you know, geopolitical winds are shifting and there have been clear signals from China that they plan to buy up and control as many sources of battery metals as possible, battery materials done as well. Um, do you think battery, Materials are a national security issue. And how do you think that it'll play out over the course of the next decade? Uh, whoever wants to jump on that. I'll start very quickly and I'll try to, but um, definitely uh, China is, is the elephant in the room. And I think overall their strategy for battery materials has been, you know, they're probably a decade or at least a decade and a half ahead of the West in, in their thinking and their planning um, and where they don't have an abundant supply of a particular uh, metal or mineral, they will, they are getting it from somewhere else, but they have the processing capacity. So they have built processing capacity for lithium uh, hydroxide, lithium cobalt, um, uh, carbonate, uh, and every other aspect of it. Um, and again, they have 100% of the graphite. Um, they are also have their thumb on probably most of the graphite deposits in Africa um that the australians are developing so china is definitely well ahead and i think if you look at benchmark when they say about how many factories are being built uh you know probably if there's one built in the west there's 10 built in china um so um china is is the fact and again i think we'll, we'll see a similar 
pattern where what they have, they're going to use domestically. Uh, similar to rare earths a while ago where they went into simply a quota situation where they wouldn't export or only export a small amount. I think we'll see that with, with graphite, for example, in our case. And uh, I'm not sure really about their capacity to process and, and, and deal with nickel, but uh, you guys will know better than I. But um, yeah, China is, it's a game of catch up and, and trying to, you know, where China doesn't care about certain things that we're all talking about, ESG and carbon footprint, um, you know, they're in the Congo, um, the DRC uh, getting cobalt, where we're all talking about, you know, um, other issues that are, are maybe shying away from getting cobalt from uh from the DRC, so um, and you need cobalt to help with, to support the uh, deal with uh, nickel. So that's pretty important for what you guys are doing too. So um, yeah, China is the elephant in the room, and uh, we are looking to be an alternative uh, and part of a picture where we need, you know, as I said, seventy plus mines uh, and also the processing capacity. So and we're seeing the EU um, and and the, and the United States have very little capacity to process any of what, any of the materials we're talking about. You know, 100% uh, comes from China. The United States has zero capacity to process graphite, probably very minimal processing capacity for, for nickel um, and, and lithium, and et cetera, et cetera. So, um, yeah, that's a good, a good, excellent question. Yeah, I just want to very quickly uh, echo uh, some of what uh, Don said, but particularly about the ESG considerations. I mean, China dominates nickel supply and cobalt supply, as you know, as well as lithium and graphite and you know the whole suite. But boy, uh, if you look at the largest producer of nickel today, uh, it's Indonesia, and it's largely with Chinese money. Um, and in Indonesia, both for nickel pig iron for the steel business uh, and for the limonite portion uh, for HPEL projects. It, you know, they're strip mines and they are in most cases stripping down tropical rainforests, mile after mile yeah. after mile of tropical rainforest. Who knows how many species they're they're destroying. Uh, in the case of HPL, they're processing very aggressively with sulfuric acid. Uh, and then in most cases, again, dumping their tailings in the ocean. Who knows what's happening there? You know, you can get a permit in a hurry if you know who to pay, I'll say it, uh, in Indonesia. Um, and uh, stripping down all these rainforests as well, and this is something that I've been recently learning about, you know, you just leave these fields of mud, then it rains, as it does in this part of the world, and then you have mudslides that engulf villages and kill villagers. And according to the uh, Indonesian government, uh, these mudslides weren't caused by deforestation, they were caused by rain. It's an act of God. What what can you do? You know. So, I just I just this whole idea that you know we're going to save the planet by driving electric vehicles. It depends. It depends where the raw materials are being sourced. Anyways, I've stood up on that. Yeah, I mean, I I think that's uh, you know we've we've been talking. Uh, somewhat to you know carbon credit people and and just trying to understand just from our own you know as we go forward even even drilling so that we can you know have a carbon neutral impact because more and more investors are very sensitive to the esg elements of your program and that makes sense you know in the context of the world that we're working in and and, and uh you know then you, ha you have these egregious you know um acts that, that give mining a bad name everywhere and and uh that's uh, really sort of uh frustrating to see as a, a when you're actually trying to do things right and uh it's not working but i suspect as as uh, uh, sean said that probably there'll be a uh, uh bifurcated market where you'll actually start to get uh paid more if you actually have a high esg deliverable yeah. nickel and yeah. uh, you know for for, the, for these contracts because these car companies are actually selling to consumers who actually do care so if you're buying uh you know these uh, dirty laterites from indonesia you're probably not going to get such an attractive uh, response from your automotive guys at least in north america maybe it's different in other parts of the world but uh yeah i think there'll be there's it's there's a there's a lot unfolding there uh for sure in this world and and uh you know, I think that 
you know, for, for us, when we were looking at, you know, developing NISC, you know, we're blessed by having Hydro Quebec literally across the road. So obviously having be able to tie into that capacity would be something you would definitely engineer into it. And I think a lot of times if you go at it with a, you know, a, a very uh, strong ESG approach, it doesn't necessarily have to cost more. You know, it, you just have to think smarter, you know, and, and re-engineer your processes. And and there there's lots of, lots of new tech out there, new approaches to doing things better and more efficiently. So I think, uh, and we've been, you know, sleepy overall in, in, the, in the mining world, generally speaking, just doing same old thing, same old thing. But I think as a result of the shakeup that's coming, uh, we're going to start to use some, some newer technologies and some newer innovative, cleaner tech uh, that will ultimately deliver, you know, maybe even more efficient, uh, you know, mining. So uh, I think there's, you know, there's both good and bad happening out there. And, and uh, you know, the, uh, the who, who wins in the end, I'm not sure, but uh, hopefully the uh, environment. You know, Terry, you may yeah. want to talk to um, Dr. Greg Dippel at uh, the University of British Columbia, because he's been working on uh, passive sequestration of uh, CO2 in uh, silicates, you know, silicate tailings for like 20 years. Yeah. And both nickel deposits, but also diamond uh, deposits. He's been working with Diabek and the Northwest Territories. Yeah, maybe he, I'll email you afterwards and get that contact from you if you can. Yeah, no, he's, a, he's a really that. smart guy. And he's developed a method of, of uh, quantifying how much uh, CO2 uh, is being absorbed and you know working on you know getting that certified by the relevant authority so you could actually claim carbon credits and uh very very interesting work um so so not only do the silicates convert to carbonate minerals and sequester co2 basically forever i mean you'd have to pour acid on the wow. you know, on, on on it to release the carbon again um but there's also a process of cementation that happens and so if you want a nice secure tailings management facility that that uh, that process of cementation is really really interesting anyways i will tell you that yeah, cool cool thank you yeah that's the nice thing about uh, graphite here in in sri lanka is that it's it's high grade car, highest grade in the world 95 carbon so we don't have the primary processing so we don't have that tailings <laughs> the tailings issue but like mm -hmm. i've had with other projects so it's nice to see. The bottom line is, you I mean you can't have these nice green automobiles with dirty inputs. Simply put, yep. um, and it's just another, another layer. We we've just commissioned a, you know the RLCA um, study, and, and it covers all that aspect of it. So the the uh, the car manufacturers want to see your you know CO two per kilogram of production of, of the anode graphite. So it's I think it's part and parcel with how we do business going forward. And I and Terry, I did see. I think I saw, um, or um, Robert Freeland talking about. Yeah, we just can't go in and into Indonesia and, and you know strip mine nickel and then you know do all the damage and and be acceptable anymore uh, for what we're going, um, what we're going ahead with this this, this industry. It, it's it just changed the scope of things uh, completely. But you know, um, we're we're sticking to these rules. We got to make sure everybody else does too. Yes. Absolutely. Uh, just as a note, um, you know, to the audience and the and gentlemen and yourselves as well, uh, you may have noticed that Sean's dropped. He's uh, I've been messaging him. Unfortunately, his uh, his hotel Wi-Fi is completely cut out. Um, but you know, we thank him for coming <laughs> on. Um, we have had so many questions uh, come in. Uh, you know, we've been able to address a few of them naturally. Uh, you know, a couple explicitly. Um, but uh, we really only have enough time today uh, to do sort of what I'd like to go through at the uh, as the final act um i'd like to go around the room and just uh you know offer each of you the chance to uh, you know, get on your soapbox talk about your company what's coming next what's exciting uh what should people in the room be paying attention to uh, and then we'll we'll close off for the day um and then no i think we'll go in reverse order from uh from our start uh, terry let's uh, let's begin with you okay great yeah so uh we're just uh closing a financing i guess it'll get closed uh probably later this week or early next week, and that will allow us to <clears throat> ramp up uh, additional exploration at NISC, and we'll be uh, starting to release assays and drill results uh, in the next, I would say, week to 10 days, and we'll probably release over the next uh, three months, which is great, and then we'll compile that and put it into a uh, amended and updated uh, 43101, and we're you know, we're thinking that this is going to go a long ways to showing that NISC is uh, is going to be a commercial mine, and, and we're we're anxious to continue to push that forward and to uh, 
create a an opportunity for a nice uh, uh, nickel sulfate uh, mine in uh, in Quebec. So that's what uh, Power Nickel is going to be focusing on for the next uh, several months and uh, next year. Appreciate it, Terry. Mark, what about you? Well, we're working on our pre-feasibility study, and so that's just going on constantly. Uh, it should be out by the end of the second quarter of 2023. Just a you know, it's a massive project, and it's a lot of work. Um, but we're also looking uh, looking ahead at the next step. So we think to get from uh, the end of our pre-feasibility study to shovel ready, including the environmental assessment for a, for a project of this size, it's probably going to be somewhere in the range of 40 to $50 million. And we're looking to attract uh, another strategic investor in for a minority interest of the project um, to help fund that. And we're working on that constantly. Some of them may want to wait and see uh, see how the PFS looks. That would be natural. But I think uh, I think there's going to be a lot of competition for this, and uh, you know some of them may not even wait. And if you're um, if you sign an NDA with us, you can actually review the pre-feasibility bits as they're going forward. Um, you know, as each section gets done. So so you don't have to wait you know blindly until the end if you're serious about doing your due diligence. Absolutely. Thank you, Mark. And uh, Don, you have the honor of being our bookends for today. So feel free to go ahead. Thanks. Uh, as you see, I'm, I'm sitting here in Sri Lanka. Right? I've been here for three weeks. Uh, my task here is to um, just sort of streamline some of our issues on, on operations. We have two mines near term to be hoisting graphite. Um, we jumped into the going to production into some past producing mines um, so instead of doing all the t traditional 43101. Um, we do have a 431 resource, but small scale. Um, so we're my task here, and I'm a mining engineer, so it's kind of fun to be hands on um, with with two mines, um, near term production, and then scouting out our within our properties more. Uh, and try to get you know mine three four five six um, and just continue on there uh, dealing with the um, lo the new government here uh, so things are turning around economically so the future is pretty bright for what we're doing here in Sri Lanka uh, and the, but the main thing we're dealing with is 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 for, for is to make batteries so we have our operations in the UK uh, we'll have some more battery results coming out being made with our vein graphite um, both baseline graphite um, anodes and then silicon enhanced uh, as well. Um, I got a great team in, in, in the UK as well and trying to focus a bit more of our potential production of that in the in the UK with with uh, with them spending lots of money to uh, to advance their industry. And we're seeing that a lot of um, of these manufacturers want to have uh, graphite or have have their their producers, their raw material production within uh, within their borders. So we're seeing that we're going to have hopefully some multiple areas where we're producing um, anode graphite. So that's where we're at. And again, uh, it's exciting to see the demand that's coming and the fact that graphite's finally being recognized as as a one of these one of these supply critical materials. Um, so it's it's nice to see. That's good to hear. Well, gentlemen, I want to thank you all again for coming on today and, uh, and providing such a great uh, conversation. Of course, also, we'd like to thank Sean um, but, and Evie Nickel for participating. To everyone in the audience, I want to thank you for joining us. And everyone who asked questions, we are going to be passing those along to the teams here so they can get back to you, uh, rest assured. But with that, gentlemen, that's all we have for today. Thank you again. Thank you to the yes. audience. I hope you all have a good rest of your day. Thank you.